Hey, the end is nigh. <laughs> With that kind of music, you want to do something really dramatic, don't you? So I thought, well, there you go. They were all um, daring me earlier on to do that. <laughs> uh, so good to be here this morning and so good to see so many of you. And um, it's going to be another week of weirdness, maybe. Um, so uh, obviously last week we, um, uh, we looked at, at the return of Christ and uh, particularly we looked through the book of Thessalonians and uh, that was just the return of Christ, the resurrection of, uh, of the dead and uh, we looked at the reunion of Christians with God in heaven uh, briefly. <clears throat> Now, next week, we are going to do an overview of the book of Revelation. It's going to obviously be a quick overview, (laughs) um, because if I just did uh, five minutes on each chapter, then uh, I would be here for quite a while. Uh, So just reading it would take quite a a while. But um, I'm just going to briefly kind of give it, because I think what's important for us is to, when we read some of these, this literature, uh, is to have a framework, to have an understanding of what we're reading so we can kind of fit it into a framework. And if you have an overall framework, then it makes it more understandable what's going on and why, what you're reading and how it makes sense in the reading of that. Um, you know, so if you're studying any subject, for example, um, you need to be able to have a framework. You need to have some way of understanding how it fits into the bigger, bigger picture of things. So that's uh, next week. And so next week will be the weirdest of the weirdest. Okay. Um, so uh, it's one of those, dare you come next week. <laughs> um, uh, but today I'm going to talk about your end times. I'm going to talk about what happens to you in the future. And, uh, and so this is important. It's not just what will happen to the world, but what will happen to us as individuals. And so first of all, I want to build a little bit of a foundation uh, for today. And it's found in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. And it's uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 and 13. And so the words of Jesus, to start us out, says this. Jesus says, behold, behold what? Behold, I am coming soon. So that's what Jesus said. He says, I am coming back again. And what then he said, they says, and my reward is with me. He says, I will give to everyone according to what? to what they have done. Yes, I think this is important for us. He said, said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Yes, behold, he goes on to say, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. The Alpha and Omega is important. He is the beginning and the end. Yes, I don't know whether I mentioned that last week or whether I mention it next week, because often (laughs) I get a bit confused, but that's important that he is the very start of all things and all things find their finish in him. Now, I just want to quickly just say to you as I talk about some of these things is that um, as Christians, I want us to be, maybe you're here today or maybe you're online and you're not a Christian, I just want to be very clear that none of us are good enough to get to heaven. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what good things you've done in your life. From every single one of us, none of us deserve to be in heaven. Yes, we're all sinners. And the only way any of us can get into heaven is because of Jesus and what he has done on the cross, that he died and that he was risen again for us. So the the thing is, is that for those of us who are Christians, we will be rewarded for the things that we've done. 
So we're not going to be, uh, you don't become a Christian by the things that you do. But when you are a Christian, the things that you do will be rewarded. And so that's part of the deal. So, for example, a pastor and a taxi driver die. Just imagine if I died and you've got a taxi driver dies. They go to heaven, St. Peter meets them at the gate, at the pearly gates, and, uh, and St. Peter goes, come on in, pastor. We've been expecting you. We've got prepared for you a lovely three-bedroomed house and en suite in the bedrooms and a lovely garden. And, and you know, we've, we've even got, you know, uh, you, you just some, the best plants that we could, we could find to fit in this garden. And I'm going, oh, great, great, great. Then a taxi driver comes up and St. Peter says to the taxi driver, he says, oh, we've been expecting you too. And we've got for you a seven-bedroom house. And we've got for you, we've got you overlooking some of the most luscious pastures. Your garden is, is, is just goes on and on forever. And I'm going, hang on a minute. That's not fair. I've been giving my life for this work. What's, what's the deal? I say, ah, well, St. Peter says, it's all based on results. So, for example, when you preached, people fell asleep. But when the taxi driver drove, people prayed. <laughs> so, I know that's a joke. But in other words, it's that whole aspect of it doesn't matter on position. It's all about results. And for some people, I think we're going to be very surprised and some people who have had no limelight have had nothing and we get, they get to heaven and they're going to have rewards way beyond for some of us that think, wait, well, I think I deserve better. Because it's based on what we've done for the Lord Jesus Christ. How we live on earth determines how we will be rewarded in heaven. Now Luke 8, 17 says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, scary, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Now, I don't know about you, but there are things in my life that I do not want out into the open. Yes? Uh, J. John uses an illustration, and he says, he says, it'd be like going to heaven, and God puts on a big movie screen and he, he just says, this is your life. And everybody that's been in your life, the people that you've talked about, you've thought about, you've kind of done them, whatever, they're all in the audience <laughs> watching your life. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be scary. I wouldn't want that if I was on my own. Never mind with everybody watching on. But it's, but it's so important for us to understand that there is no secrets with God. He sees all things. He knows all things. He is beyond us. And so last week, I think we talked about it briefly, but there are two judgments. And so there are two different judgments. And the first one is the judgment seat of Christ. This is what it's called, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the question you might be asking is, what is it? And when does it take place? So let's just answer it. For the simple reason, a lot of Bible scholars believe that it will take place right after the return of Jesus to take his church to heaven, the rapture, yes? And, uh, and that's what I believe. The reason they believe this, or one of the reasons they believe this, is because of a little verse in the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 14. And uh, he's there and he's saying to them, if you throw a dinner party... Don't just invite your family and your friends and the people who will pay you back. So I kind of, I throw a barbecue and, and so because they'll throw me a barbecue and I'll get invited. But no, he's saying to himself, no, uh, don't just invite those people. Instead, invite the poor, invite the lame, invite those that are not going to be able to re repay you, um, you know, or reward you. And then in Luke 14, verse 14, he says this, although the poor cannot repay you, 
you will be rewarded or you will be repaid, yes, when Re the resurrection of the righteous. Absolutely. And so a lot of people believe, me included, that the judgment seat will take place after those who are in Christ, who are Christians uh, that have, that have uh, either died or we are, who are alive and are caught up to be with Jesus and to meet him in the air. That's when there is the judgment seat of Christ. Yes? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Yes? Now, so this is the thing. Now, most scholars believe that this is the judgment, and it, it makes total sense to me, that the judgment seat of Christ is for Christians alone. It's for us, for believers, yes? Um, it's, in other words, we're not judged for salvation. We are already saved. We're already in, into heaven. We're already part of the family of God, but we will be judged for rewards. And the reason for that is simply the Greek word, which is translated judgment seat, is the word in Greek, bema. So it's often referred to the bema seat, the bema judgment of Christ. And this was based, when they were talking about this, this was based on the Greek games, the, like the Olympic games, when they used to train like mad for this. And they used to be at the end of the race, there would be a judge at the end of the race. Now, the judge at the end of the race was not trying to say whether you're alive or you're in or you're out. The judge at the end of the race was quite simply to say, you come first, you come second, you come third, and to issue the prizes, whether it was a crown or a wreath or whatever it might be. So in other words, it was a judgment for rewards. Yes, it was no punishment involved in it. It's quite simply for that. So they were there to congratulate, and that's what... The beamer seat of Christ, the judgment of Christ is there. It's there for us to get congratulated by Jesus. I'm looking forward to that. Yes? Yes? Anybody else? <laughs> so it's important for us. Now, I don't know what the rewards will be. It doesn't clarify what the rewards will be, but we do know some of the rewards. And one of the, some of the rewards are called crowns. You will receive crowns. Now, I don't know if there's how many crowns there are, but we know there is at least five crowns. So I just want to quickly go through those five crowns that we can get as a reward. And so the first one is the incorruptible crown. And that's for those who run a faithful race. Yes, those who are devoted to Christ all their life. They finish well, yes? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 27 says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last a little bit longer. How long will it last? Forever. Absolutely. Yes. The second crown is the crown of rejoicing for those who share their faith. If you invite your friend to church, if you invite them to your connect group, if you talk to people, whether at your work or your neighbours or whatever it is, <coughs> then you will receive this crown. Isn't that fantastic? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 says this, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. We're going to get a crown when we, re when we bring people into the kingdom of God, when we show them the way of salvation. Isn't that fantastic? There's rewards every time you share your faith. The third crown is a crown of righteousness. And this is for those who long for Christ returning. Remember last week we talked about Maran um, I hope I can't even say it. Maranatha, uh, you know, uh, for Jesus coming soon. Uh, well, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, 
It says there, now there is in store for me, this is Paul talking, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all. Who does all include? Everyone. Yes, have longed for his appearing. If you long for Jesus to come back, there's a reward. Just for longing for his coming. That's got to be an easy one, hasn't it? Just get hungry for God. The fourth crown is a crown of glory. And this is for faithful pastors. When we get there, you'll go, oh, so you weren't faithful. <laughs> It'll all come out in the end, yes? So, so I, I'm, I'm into this one, okay? I'm into this. 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when, when, not if, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. If ever there's a, 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 a reason to want to be in leadership, every connect group leader that's pastoring people, you know, everybody that's in some kind of leadership, you're going to get a crown for faithful service. And fifthly, there's the crown of life. If you've ever suffered for Jesus Christ, this is the crown that you will get. Yes, it's for those that were martyred, for those that have suffered horrendously for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ will receive this. James chapter 1 and verse 12 said, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive McDonald's. A helicopter. He will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's five crowns. I'm sure there must be many more. There's all, you know, God isn't going to, he's not short on giving rewards, is he? He, he loves it. Now, just in case you think, ah, well, you see, I've got the pastor's crown. Strutting round heaven. Uh -uh, yeah. Just in case you think, oh, well, I've brought a lot of people to Jesus. Get my crown. You think, I brought that many, I'll have crowns. I'll be up here. Well, just in case of that, we've got a verse in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10 that says this. It says that the elders receive their crown. And what do they do with their crowns? It says in, the, in verse 10, it says, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. In other words, the elders, and I'm going to be there, I know how I'm going to be, is that for every reward that there's going to be, I'm going to recognize that I don't deserve it. I'm going to recognize it's something that I've never really earned and deserved it. He gave me salvation. He gave me the opportunities. I just took those opportunities. And then he's coming and he's saying, I'm going to reward you. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to be like the elders and we're going to say, Lord, I don't deserve these. And we're going to fall at his feet. And we're going to worship him with everything that is within us. And say, God, I just love you. I have served you. I want to be with you. That's what we're going to be. It's going to change everything. I'm going to say, we're not going to look at them rewards and go pride. We're going to look at those rewards those and say, I don't deserve them. Jesus, just to see you, to know you is way beyond everything. You deserve everything. And so we will fall at his feet and give him everything, every aspect of it. So let me ask you a question. <coughs> will you have anything 
to put at the feet of Jesus. That's a pertinent question, isn't it? What will you be able to put at the feet of Jesus? Now, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And I just want us to kind of, I just quickly give a bit of a timeline to some of the events that are in there. Now, if you've got notes, you can quickly take notes. Um, <clears throat> or you can listen to it later and go through them. So I've just a suggested timeline. What is it? It is a suggested timeline, okay? It's not, we're not saying this is in concrete. We're not kind of saying this is the way, because, you know, there are good people that are real good at the Scriptures that see things differently, yes? But they still long for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm just trying to give you a suggested, what I believe, what I think is the way. Is that Okay. So pens are the ready. So last week we noted, first of all, that Christ will return. It's where he comes in the air. And secondly, that the dead in Christ will rise. Yes? So he comes, the dead in Christ go first to meet him. And then thirdly, who else? We who are alive. Yes? So he comes, the dead go rise first. Then thirdly, we who are alive. Yes, Christians will be raptured. So that's the third thing. Fourthly, is believers will be rewarded. And I've talked a little bit about that. Um, but, but, it, but it seems to me that believers are rewarded very early on in the process. It seems to me that when, uh, when Christ comes and the church is caught up, that that's when the judgment seat of Christ is. That's when we get the rewards. That's when we have the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's where we, we feast and we become uh, one with Christ. Yes? And so that's that. So again, it's back to the uh, Luke 14, 14. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Yes? Fifthly then, will come the seven-year tribulation. Revelation 7 and verse 14. There's, there's, this is a seven-year tribulation, but actually halfway through, three and a half years into it, it's going to get dramatically worse than it was in the first half. Yes, that's when the Antichrist is going to rise during this time. Yes, so we've got the seven-year tribulation. And that's why for some people, they think that the church will be raptured just before it gets really bad. Okay, um, that's called mid-rapture. Yes? Uh, uh, thing. Okay. Then sixthly, then there will be the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, verse 19. This is where evil fights righteousness. There's a big battle going on there. Yes? And guess who wins? Absolutely. <laughs> Every time God wins. Yes? And so seventhly, Satan, as a result of the victory, Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit in Revelation 20, verse 2, where he is bound for a thousand years. Yes? Only to be released at the end of that thousand years for a short period of time before God does away with him forever. Yes? God has a plan. Everything, he has a plan. It's absolutely phenomenal. So that's it. Then eighthly, which obviously is during the thousand year, uh, you know, when Satan's bound up, that's when Jesus comes with his church and we rule and we reign with him for a thousand years. Yes? So you never know. You might be the mayor of Teesside. <laughs> You might be the Prime Minister of England. You, I don't know what we... We don't know, do we? But we do know that we will rule and reign with him. We as his church will be the ones that will rule and reign through the millennial reign. And so it's knowing that the first time he comes back, he comes back for his church. And then the second time when he comes back, he comes back with his church. Does that make sense? Yes? To rule and to reign. Then ninthly... Then comes the resurrection of the dead. Now you're thinking we've already had the resurrection of the dead. No, but this is the resurrection of the unsaved dead. Yes, the unrighteous dead is this one. Yes, because we looked at that quickly last week, two resurrections. The first resurrection is for those who are in Christ. And the second resurrection is for those who are not Christians, have never accepted Christ, uh, don't want to know 
Christ. And so this is known as the resurrection of the dead. And they will be judged at the great white throne. What a name. Great white throne. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I like that. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15 on that one. So that's the 10th one. Then 11thly, then God will establish a new heaven and a new earth. So that's where we're up to, yeah? So the question I know you're all thinking is, but what will heaven be like? What will heaven be like? Well, I'm glad you asked it. (laughs) Because sometimes when you talk to people, they think, oh, I'm going to be bored in heaven. All I'm going to do is watch angels playing the harp on a cloud or something, you know. It's just, what could there be? I want to say, you know, like when we had worship this morning, yeah, the guys were leading it. I don't know about you, but I love it. I, I absolutely, you know, it makes my week. Um, and, and when they get it right, <laughs> I'm only joking, but... But you're just, and it's, it's awesome. I just want you to think about that. Think in heaven, just think you're going to, wherever. I mean, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've been to some big conferences. And, and if, like me, you've been to somewhere there's thousands upon thousands of people being worshipping together. And the atmosphere is electric. It's amazing. It's better than anything that you can do. It's like if, you, if you're not a Christian and you've been to a concert and you've been to the biggest concert you can, you can be. And, uh, and that. I want to say to you, it's a bit like that some of the time. There's got to be. We're going to worship him. And I'll tell you what, they can play better than any others can play. I want to say to you that God created the instruments. When he talked about, uh, uh, you know, the angels, he created them. And some of the angels, they have, they have, they're made like musical instruments. Isn't that phenomenal? I just start imagine. Could you imagine what heaven could be like? I think we've got to imagine what heaven is. Is going to be like, it's going to be phenomenal. So what is heaven going to be like? Well, thankfully, in Revelation chapter 21, John continues with the vision that God has given him, and he talks about some of the things that heaven's going to be like. And the first thing is God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 verse 1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had what? Gone, disappeared. Yes, they were no longer around. So what you see here, you know, even if you think we've got the greatest lighting display in the world, it's going one day. It's all disappearing. But we're going to be part of a new heaven and a new earth. This new earth is going to be earth without a curse. It's not going to have the curse any longer. There's not going to be no sin on this earth. There's going to be no difficulties. It's going to be like it was in the Garden of Eden when it was perfect. It's going to be like that. It's going to be just uninterrupted fellowship with God. It's going to be fun. So think about it. Think about the things that you love on earth. Think about some of the experience you have, the thing, your best experience. I want to think about the best experience you have, the best place you've ever been. You know, the best thing. I know for some of you that's been here, listening to me. <laughs> okay. But I just want to say, whatever it is, whether it's by the seaside, you know, climbing a mountain, the view you've seen, whatever it might be, some relationship, whatever it might be, I want to say to you, heaven is going to be 10 million times better than anything that we've ever experienced on earth. It's going to be so much more better than we've ever had. Now, as long as, of course, your favorite spot wasn't by the sea, because in the new earth, there will be no sea. Did you know that? No sea. Revelations in chapter 21 talks about that. No eye has seen, Corinthians says, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. There's so much, isn't there, there? The second thing is that you will never suffer again. Yes, Revelations 21 verses 4 and 5 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making most things new. I am making some things new. I'm making the things that matter new. I'm making everything 
knew God will wipe away every tear, every pain, every anguish. He will wipe away the worries and the stress and the hunger and the sickness and the headaches and the cancer and the diabetes and the AIDS and the heartache, the divorces, the loneliness, the war, the AIDS, the famine, the genocides, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, you name it, gone, gone, gone. It's done away with. I think that's fantastic. And thirdly, you will live with God forever. This is the best bit. Because a new heaven and a new earth without me there and you there, it's not going to be the same, is it? We want to be there, don't we? And this is the way Scripture describes it in verse 3 of 21. Now remember, this is the 20th time and the final time that this phrase is used uh, in, in Revelation, obviously in, in the Bible. And he says this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, one commentary said that just because, because it's the last time, it's the most important announcement that God makes. We often say that, don't we? The people, the things that people say on the deathbed are often the greatest things, the best things, the most important things that they've ever said. So you imagine here, this is God's last words in Revelations and he's saying this to us, he's saying for the final time that where the, from the throne of God, he's saying now the dwelling of God is where? Here. Third light down. Now the dwelling of God is with us. Isn't that good? I know you kind of think you're not fully appreciating what that is. But in other words, God's saying, when he gets to there, it's done. It's finished. I've got what I dreamt about. This is the aim. This is what all of history was leading to. For me to be with my people, to be with my children, to have my family with me. It's done. It's complete. Everything is in place. This is the dream of God. This is the final thing. Now, I know our small minds can't take in the greatness and the beauty of God and his desires and all that he has with us. But one day we're going to be raised with him. Our immortal bodies, our, so our mortal bodies will be raised immortal. We will be clothed in righteousness and we will have fellowship with God. See, God created us to be in a relationship with him. That's his longing. All the time, everybody you meet, whoever they are, whatever their actions, whatever their response to you, God's heart is, I want my people. I died for my people. I love you. The whole of history, I've been planning to have a people for myself to be one with them. The problem is, unfortunately, is most people think that heaven is the default destination. Most people feel that it is the default, the default destination. So, for example, someone dies and they go, oh, yes, Uncle Joe. He was, a, he was a good guy. He was great. You know, he, was, he did all sorts of good things and he helped us with this and with that. So what we portray is, well, you know, I know he didn't go to church. He, went, he maybe went once or twice. So he went, you, you know what I'm trying to say? People kind of, we think and people often talk as if the default destination for everybody is heaven. But that's not the case. Yes, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many people, a lot of people, enter through the wrong gate. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few people find it. The tragedy is, is that most people feel heaven is the default destination. And maybe you're listening today and to say, well, if heaven isn't the default destination, that's not fair. And people often feel that it's not fair. Yes, we should go to heaven unless we've been really bad and really evil. Well, I want to say to you, actually, that, that none of us deserve to be there. None of us get in on our own merit. It doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa. It doesn't matter who you are. You don't get in on the things that you do. It's only because of Jesus, yes, that we can do that. And so we've got to understand that. And so the first judgment 
is where Christians will be rewarded. And that's important for us. But it's important for us to realize you only get to be rewarded if you've accepted Christ, if you've followed Christ, if you're devoted to Christ. Yes. And then there's a second judgment, but my time has gone. So I will finish there. And I'll finish this next week. Yeah. The intro to next week. And, uh, and we'll go for that, which is the final, uh, the final judgment. Yes. Father, I just thank you for the, what you have in store for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you have some things in store for us that are so phenomenal. And I pray now, Lord, that as we just listen to this song, I can only imagine that you would help us to grasp the beauty of what heaven and the new earth is going to be like. I pray, Lord, that every single person in here today and everyone listening and watching online would be willing to make some changes in their life because they want to put some things at your feet. I ask in Jesus' lovely name.